Okay. All righty. Well, again, uh, I want to welcome you all here this morning. I know it's been really, really challenging the last three to four days, not only outside with um, cattle, trying to keep them alive, um, but also um, in your house and trying to keep your house from having power uh, outages. So um, we really do appreciate you coming and joining us this morning. All righty, we'll get this to click again. Okay, uh, as Jeannie mentioned, we have behind the scenes, lots of team members to help this or to make this happen this morning. So you may recognize some of those as your local extension agent, and you may not recognize some of those. Um, so, so take note of those. And uh, if, if you don't see some of them on the screen, believe me, they are behind the scenes in making this happen, whether it's on Zoom, whether this is on YouTube and watching your comments. So we really wanna make this as interactive and engaging as we can. So uh, this is a collaboration of many different counties and districts in North Central and Northwest Kansas. So clear on the east edge here, the Post Rock District and the Midway District, south down here and the Walnut Creek, and then clear on the west edge, clear with the Sunflower District. So we cover a really wide range here. Alrighty, uh, before we get started here, we just have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we want to make sure that you know how to ask a question because that's the main reason of why we like you to be live here so we can have some engagement interaction and get your questions answered. So if you're watching on Zoom this morning uh, and if you, you want to use the Q&A box, so here's your screen and on the bottom right here is your Q&A box, which is the red circle. That's where we would like you to put some subject matter questions into that box. So very, very simple, just go down and click the Q&A and then just type your uh, questions in. And we have some uh, agents that are monitoring that and we will get your questions answered from our speaker today. Another uh, problem, or we hope it's not gonna be a problem or another way that you can communicate with us is through the chat box, which is also down there on the, on the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical issues, like you can't see the screen or you can't hear us or you can't hear the speaker, just type that in there. And we will have some agents monitoring that as well. And so we, we will help you out and get that fixed as well. If you're watching on YouTube Live, you can also type in your questions. But first of all, you have to make an account. So you create an account, it's very simple. There's a little button there when you're watching YouTube on the bottom of your screen that says create an account. You simply hit that button, follow the instructions, and then you can simply type in your questions in the comment box. And we will have some agents monitoring that as well. If neither of those will work for you and you still wanna ask a question, you can email your question uh, to Jeannie Falk Jones and there's her email address right there on your screen, jfalkjones at ksu.edu or if you know your agent's um, um, email address and you feel more comfortable doing that, you can email your local agent too. Um, but then all the questions would filter into one location. Alrighty. Some other engagement that we would like from you, uh, just to keep everybody engaged in the presentation today, is a pull everywhere instructions. Those of you that have used this before, that's great. There may be some on that this is the first time joining us today. So uh, it's very, very simple to use. You simply open whatever your web browser is on your phone, because a lot of people have this right beside you. So uh, simply open your web browser and type in poll everywhere, P O L L E V dot com forward slash K S U, or you can simply text. And here's a um, infographic right here on the side. The two or the address you type in 22333, and then the message you type in K S U in all caps, and then you simply hit the send button and that will help you connect to our poll everywhere. So remember, you can either open your web browser and you can do that right now if you want to, because we're gonna have a practice slide for you to use. So go to your web browser, type in pollev.com forward slash KSU, and then just follow the instructions or text 22333, the message is KSU and then hit send. Okay, so we want you, and I'm gonna like clear out the, oh, 
I probably shouldn't have cleared them out because you guys are probably already voting. Um, but go in and vote again if you like. There we go. Do you have any snow on the ground right now? Okay, so I see you're all voting there. So you can see how it's an instant and you guys can see that as well. So it's, it, it works very good. Okay, it looks like, and we'll probably give you a couple minutes or something to do that. Okay, all right, so it looks like you guys got that. Okay, uh, if you're on for CCA credit, uh, here's some uh, information for where in order to get that credit. So there's two different ways that you can uh, be sure that you get your credit for participating today. The first way is to simply email Jeannie and there's her email address right up there on the screen. So we just email jfalkjones at ksu.edu at the B. So if you wanted to do that now and at the end, but be sure you include your name and your CCA number because that helps us keep things straight when we're trying to sort out and make sure that everybody gets credit and the right people get the credit. Okay, secondly, you guys are probably used to using the QR code if you have the Certified Crop Advisor app uh, on your phone. So what we're gonna do is at the end of the session, we're gonna put the QR code up and then you can simply um, scan that in and then you'll get credit that way. So if you haven't used the QR code, remember email Jeannie Falk Jones at ksu.edu now and at the end with your name and CCA and then we'll put up the QR code at the end. Alrighty, I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie now, and she's going to introduce our speaker. Sorry, I couldn't get my buttons to all click fast enough here. So um, I'm pleased to introduce Julie Peterson, uh, Dr. Julie Peterson. She is an entomologist that I've worked with a few times over the years, and she's worked quite a bit with some of the entomologists here in Kansas. And I've actually went out and collected Western bean cutworms. Uh, egg masses for her for some of the research. And so Julie's going to spend some time visiting with us today, just talking about corn insect resistance. She's going to talk about Western uh, bean cutworm and Western corn rootworm and uh, probably some other insects to go along with this. So uh, Julie, I think this is all yours. So thanks for joining us today. I see you have your Nebraska you. shirt on for us. So we know exactly where you're from. <laughs> yes. I do, I usually gotta sport my um, Nebraska in here. <laughs> Ari, are you seeing the title slide here? Um, Julie, what we're seeing is uh, your um, screen that has the list of presentations on oh, it. Oops, all right, I one programming. The wrong thing. Let me fix that. Oh, you know, you'd think by the time we are using so many um, Zoom calls, I'd have this ready. Okay, now should be the title slide. Um, now we see a blue uh, screen with a window on it. Jeez, okay. So Julie is actually with UNL at the North Platte um, station up there. And actually I went up to her field day here a couple of years ago and it was so fun to walk in her lab. Ah, oh, there we see the title screen. It was All so right, fun thanks. to walk in her lab because she has just insects and demonstrations set up everywhere. And so if you ever have just a little bit of inkling to want to learn about insects, you should give Julia a call and swing past her lab because it's, it's fun, interesting research going on in there. I would love to do that. I would love to welcome more uh, Kansas visitors into our lab here in Nebraska. Um, yeah, so, so I am going to share with you guys some updates on kind of focusing particularly on some of the resistance issues that we've seen um, and focusing on corn rootworm and western bean cutworm for today. Um, I'm going to try to delve a little bit into some of our other integrated pest management um, areas, though, you know, not be just exclusively uh, resistance. So... Um, I'm going to start out with western corn rootworm, right? You know, we know that this is a really critical insect pest in continuous corn. The um, larvae here are going to be feeding down on the roots, doing a lot of damage. You can unfortunately end up with root systems that look like this, where the um, nodes of roots have just been pruned away. You know, you can end up with this lodging over in the field, um, really reducing harvestability and reducing yield. 
Um, so thinking about kind of the overall management approaches for corn rootworm, you know, we can think about crop rotation as being our number one option right now um, in terms of if you rotate away from a corn um, host, you can really just eliminate the rootworm population in that field. Um, we do have certain types of BT traits and seed treatments, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about BT traits. Um, we do have at plant insecticides that can be used to target the larvae in the soil. And that's important to think about um, that that's targeting a different stage versus doing an aerial insecticide application where you're targeting the adults. Now, the purpose of that might be to reduce silk clipping in the field, or it might be to reduce egg laying from those adults, so then you'd have less um, larval pressure in the following season. And then I'm going to talk a tiny bit about some biological controls. These are maybe some different types of, um, uh, of, of alternative approaches or complementary approaches that I think are possible for corn rootworm. Um, Rustin corn rootworm in particular has had a huge history of resistance, um, not just in Nebraska and Kansas, but kind of across the, the Corn Belt, really. I mean, you can go all the way back to the mid 60s when we first saw um, insecticide resistance to some of those older like organochlorine type insecticides. Um, and then that really continued into the 70s. Um, in the mid 90s, we ended up having issues with resistance to um, products like Seven um, or PenCath would be the commercial names for the insecticide AIs that are listed here. Um, our most recent issues have been with BT proteins. So these are genetically modified um, transgenic products. Um, in the kind of early 2010s, we saw our first issues with these CRY3 proteins. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about these proteins and sort of what, which um, types of BT packages they're found in. Um, in the kind of late 2010s, um, there's been work that's been done at Nebraska, Nebraska and at K-State looking at pyrethroid resistance. I'm going to share with you guys some of those um, projects and reports. And then most recently, um, we have not confirmed resistance to the CRY3435 proteins in Nebraska or Kansas yet, um, but we have had some unexpected injury and there has been confirmation of resistance in a few other geographies. So I will kind of show you what that looks like right now. Um, those CRY3 proteins, these are some of the earliest um, BT proteins that came out targeting corn rootworm. Um, that has now been, you know, fairly spread across kind of the Western Corn Belt with some patches into the Eastern Corn Belt. Of course, you can see that we do have our, you know, part uh, a swath through Nebraska and into the Northwestern corner of Kansas here. Um, and then that CRY3435 that I mentioned, um, there have been some um, selected areas of resistance shown for this, like in Iowa, Minnesota, and North Dakota. And that's something that's very much on our horizon, on our radar, is investigating um, unexpected injury in um, Kansas or Nebraska to see if we do have this resistance here. You know, I'd say it certainly is not widespread, but it's something for us to be aware of and, and looking out for. Now, these protein names are, can be really tough. So um, this is just some examples of some of the different trait packages that are out there um, and what those proteins are that are actually found in those trait packages. Now, we are really starting to move away from these packages that just have like one protein in them and more towards these stacks down here where you're actually seeing multiple proteins um, expressed in like a given trait, like the pyramided traits or the stacked traits is what we call that. Now, I find it quite confusing personally to be able to remember like which trait package names, like the commercially sold names have which proteins and then like which proteins actually do what for which different insects. And so I use this handy BT trait table constantly. It is like one of the best resources. And hopefully maybe Jeannie will help remind me at the end, I'm going to post some links to these resources in the chat for you guys. Um, 
And I just think this is a great, you know, you can look and say, okay, you know, acre max extreme, you know, here is the letters you might see at the end of the um, uh, hybrid number. And then what does that actually mean? What proteins does that have? Which insects does that work against? You know, are there cases of resistance that you need to maybe ask your local extension folks if your area is, is in that resistance area? It even shows you the herbicide trait packages and the refuge compliance if necessary. So I just love this resource. I can't say enough about it, how useful it is. Um, we do, we have seen with these areas where resistance has developed with rootworms to our BT or transgenic traits, we have seen some common characteristics. So continuous corn, of course, is going to be one of the number one traits. Um, and this is, of course, related to where you have intensive livestock production areas. I know I think between from North Platte to Garden City, I think we have, it's like, I don't know how much percentage, way more than half of all of the cattle that are in feedlots um, in the US are, are in our region. So we definitely have this high demand for corn, a lot of intensive corn and continuous corn production. Um, seeing history of repeated use of the same single protein BT traits. So like for that first one, you know, maybe folks who were growing um, like the yield guard rootworm over and over on the same field were some of the first fields to see resistance. Um, you know, they're seeing moderate to severe larval rootworm injury, and then a lot of rootworm adult beetle populations, and seeing increasing use of at plant soil insecticides um, over top of those traits, um, and a lot of extra chemical, uh, chemigation, or aerial application. So um, this has really led to some issues with trying to manage rootworms. Um, in kind of the first half of the 2010s, um, this was a little bit before I arrived at Nebraska in 2014 even, um, folks were getting reports from Nebraska and from Kansas of having um, control issues with pyrethroid foliar applications for rootworm, western corn rootworm beetles. So, um, Several researchers from Nebraska and Kansas really tried to look into this, and they wanted to test how susceptible was Western corn rootworm to the product bifenthrin. This is the active ingredient that's in products like Brigade and Capture um, and some others. So um, what they did is they looked at beetles that they knew were susceptible to bifenthrin, and they established the concentration of that insecticide that was needed to kill 99% of the beetles. So they then collected um, beetles from the field and exposed them to that concentration that's supposed to kill 99% and they saw how many actually died. Um, and those beetles were collected actually all across the US. And unfortunately, Nebraska and Kansas, we were the ones where we saw problems. <laughs> so I'm gonna focus in on Nebraska and Kansas maps here. And you can see that as you moved from east to west across those states and really kind of focused here on our southwest part of Nebraska and our western part of Kansas, these are the areas where we saw problems. Now that concentration of insecticide was supposed to kill 99%, but you can see in the orange and the red, there's actually way fewer beetles that are actually dying from that insecticide. So the red are, are the worst where it's supposed to kill 99%, but actually 30% or less of the beetles died that were collected from those areas. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Now, another way to look at those results is in this um, kind of graph. What you're seeing down here is, um, you know, the bar is supposed to be close to 99 or 100. That's what we would expect if the insects are um, you know, susceptible, the bifenthrin is working. But what we're actually seeing is a lot of populations that are quite a bit less than that. Now, here are some of those Kansas ones. You can see um, Finney and Sherman, um, and these are in like the 50s instead of 99%. Um, what I really wanna point out that's very interesting from these data is um, there was one field that was collected more than once across the same summer. So this is Perkins County in Southwest Nebraska. This is the same field. 
when beetles were collected on July 23rd and exposed to that 99% um, concentration, um, only 31% died. So that's not good already. Um, unfortunately, that grower did go in and do a pyrethroid application. And then after it was sprayed, more beetles were collected from the same field on August 7th. And those beetles only 4% died instead of the 99%. So that's actually showing you like kind of within that season, how that application of pyrethroids was further selecting for resistance. You know, that there were more beetles in that field that now had the resistance in them after being sprayed. So I think this is kind of showing like how that resistance actually is, is developed and selected for um, in the field. So to summarize kind of this first study here, bifenthrin, which is the um, active ingredient that's um, one of the really common pyrethroids, we do see resistance in Western Nebraska and in Kansas. Um, so we are also showing, this is the first study that showed this resistance to pyrethroids was emerging as a problem, um, you know, as early as 2014. But we did have some questions because this kind of this, this concentration that kills 99%, like that's sort of a lab based number. And we don't know how that relates to like an actual formulation of, you know, an insecticide being sprayed in the field. And so we wanted to take this more lab based study and kind of translate it into what's that mean for when you actually go and spray rootworms in the field, what does that do? And so to do that study, um, we worked here in North Platte with our pesticide application technology specialist. We wanted to determine first how much of that insecticide active ingredient and in what um, pattern is that spray reaching the rootworm out in a cornfield when it's been sprayed with a plane. Um, can we reproduce that kind of spray pattern um, in the spray chamber? and then run that um, against rootworm beetles that are susceptible and are resistant from the field to give us a better idea of what is actually happening in the field when you spray a pyrethroid against these beetles. So the first step was measuring that spray deposition. You all may have seen these before, these water sensitive cards. It's a really nice way to um, look at droplet size, um, droplet distribution after a spray application. Um, we put these cards in the top, the middle, and the bottom of the canopy. So the um, middle of the canopy is really what we were most focused on, because if you think about corn rootworm beetles at the time when you might spray them, um, they are going to be often feeding at the silks, right? So that middle of the canopy is important. It doesn't matter if they get great insecticide up at the top, if the beetles are in the middle, we wanna we want know what insecticide is getting to the middle where the beetles actually are located. So we um, worked with uh, aerial applicator to do a two and a five gallon per acre application um, with those cards out in the field. And we were able to look at the cards and actually determine, um, you know, it may have been two gallons per acre coming out of the airplane, but by the time you reach the middle of the canopy at the ears, you got about 1.2 gallons per acre that made it there. And when you had five gallons per acre coming out of the airplane, you ended up with about like one and three quarters gallons that made it to the ear. Um, we looked at that droplet size. This is really just kind of showing that some droplets are really tiny, some droplets are really big, most droplets are in the middle, and those in the middle um, were about one one hundredth of an inch in size. So with using that information, we now went to the wind tunnel and we replicated um, how to reproduce that pattern to kind of reproduce or replicate an aerial application. Um, and we reproduced those aerial applications um, in the spray chamber we used the Brigade 2EC bifenthrin product, and we tested the low and high label rates for that insect, for that product against Western corn rootworm, which was 2.1 and 6.4 fluid ounces per acre. 
And we also reproduced those two and five gallon per acre carrier volume applications. So we sprayed um, Petri dishes and then we put beetles onto those dishes. And we used beetles that came from um, two different populations from the field in Nebraska that that previous study had indicated had resistance. And then two different beetle populations that we knew um, did not have resistance. So those were susceptible. And what I wanna show you here is first of all, that actually the carrier volume in this case did not affect the results, but the insecticide rate did. So we have in the gray are our susceptible. These are the ones where we think that the insecticide is gonna kill the beetle and it did. You saw you had 100% mortality for those, no matter if it was 2.1 or 6.4 fluid ounce um, insecticide rate. What was interesting was that our two different resistant populations, these came from Keith and Perkins County in Nebraska, they um, were only had like 40 to 50% that died. Actually, I have those numbers to fill in. Yeah, only like 40 to 50% of them died when we reproduced um, like what an aerial application with 2.1 fluid ounces would look like. And when we reproduced what an aerial application with 6.4 fluid ounces per acre looked like, we saw 70 to 80% died. So that's kind of giving you a better idea of what this resistance looks like when you spray these beetles with a real product at real commercial formulations in the field. Um, is that you definitely are not getting very good control at all with the low label rate and, and really not the type of control you'd want either with the high label rate of this product due to there being this resistance in the field. So we also um, really had this question, you know, the, um, so far this has been looking at the adult beetles. And that was sort of where the problems first came up was in adult beetle control. But a lot of the same products or active ingredients are used um, for larvae, for in furrow at plant as well. So we had the question of, is this pyrethroid resistance passed on to the larvae? Um, really, the, unfortunately, yes, is the answer. We did some pyrethroid in furrow at plant um, product tests and they did perform poorer in areas where the rootworms were resistant to pyrethroids. So this graph is showing you um, root injury. So in this case, a higher number means that there is more feeding damage on the roots. So higher number is worse in this case. Um, this was Saunders County in Eastern Nebraska. This is a population that we are saying is, um, has no resistance. So this is what we would have expected, right? If you put no insecticides down, you get a lot more feeding damage. But by using um, Capture, Force, or Aztec, we significantly reduced feeding damage. However, in our populations like Clay County, Nebraska, we started to see that, oh, our bifenthrin, our Capture product is really not working quite as well. And then in Keith County, Nebraska, we actually didn't see any differences um, where the insecticide products here really did not help to reduce feeding damage. Um, so that's definitely a concern, right? So our, our take homes here for our rootworm studies um, is that we do see resistance to the CRY3 proteins in Western Nebraska um, and in Kansas. We do have pyrethroid insecticides that are no longer highly effective against Western corn rootworm adults and the larvae in Southwest Nebraska and in Kansas, um, and the Western part of Kansas. Um, so this really lets us know we need to rotate our mode of action away from pyrethroids. Um, we need to check active ingredients on labels, especially when you're considering adults and larvae. I think that's something that can be tough is, you know, the product brigade is, is more for the adults, um, but it's actually the same active ingredient as capture, even though it has a different commercial name, it's the same active ingredient. So checking those labels and being aware of that is important when you're thinking about rotating modes of action as well. Um, but root worm management is really not a what is the one 
one best single silver bullet trait or insecticide situation. You know, we need to think about multiple tactics, crop rotation, you know, planting um, effective BT traits, um, judicious use of insecticides for adult and or larval control, um, and then this biological control um, question as well. So with this biological control question, we're um, looking into some new studies of using beneficial nematode worms. So these are, you know, unlike the plant parasitic nematodes, these are actually beneficial ones that can um, kill rootworms. So this is something we're looking into and hopefully will be promising. You know, I think this broad goal should really be both to limit rootworm economic injury, but also limit evolution of resistance. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off between sometimes longer term and shorter term goals um, in terms of trying to limit this year in the field, the damage you see, but also try to rotate modes of action and not um, get that uh, resistance over time. So I think I'll just take a couple of minutes to talk about maybe some rootworm questions that are in the chat, because our next shift is really going to be over to Western bean cutworm. And so while we're maybe talking about the beetles, I will um, answer that. So the first one is, what mode of actions have you found to be most effective against adult rootworm beetles? So one of the products that we have looked at that I do like as far as having a different mode of action um, and being quite effective is the steward product. Um, you know, so that does have a, you know, it's a very different mode of action than say our pyrethroids. It um, is a little bit less um, toxic to like our beneficial insects. So I think that's good if we can try to like preserve some of our lady beetles and lace wings and things out there in the field. Um, you know, we are of course seeing some restrictions with the use of like chlorine Um, uh, so although that's one that works, that's one that's not as available. And that's one that's very harsh against, um, uh, against the, um, beneficials as well. So it is really challenging. I think we actually are in kind of a difficult position right now where we are losing tools and we're not necessarily gaining tons of new tools against rootworms right now. Um, the next question is, um, what do you recommend to mitigate the resistance? So that's hugely challenging with rootworm resistance, uh, particularly when you think about um, the BT resistance, because what we're actually seeing is that the BT resistance is not going away from the populations. Like kind of once it's there, it's, it's kind of staying there. And it's a challenge to try to go back. I think that moving forward, a good view is, I mean, really if we can reduce overall rootworm populations through crop rotation, is huge, you know, even if it's just like, okay, I'll grow continuous corn for three or four years and then I'll introduce, you know, one non-corn in the rotation, that in, in itself can really help. Um, you know, we don't have uh, rotation resistance here. Um, and so that for us can help. Um, the other aspect of that is thinking about like newer products that are coming out where they are doing more pyramiding and stacking. You know, I am excited about the RNAi technology. This would be like in SmartStacks Pro, and, and I believe some other companies are introducing this as well. I'm sorry, I don't know your commercial names yet, but um, there are some extra rootworm targeting products there that should be coming onto the market soon. Um, I'll do, I think actually I'll move on for Western bean cutworm, and then I'll definitely kind of circle back around here to some extra questions. So, all right, Western bean cutworm. This is one that I do focus on quite a lot in my lab. Um, of course, right now, those um, insects are down in their pre-pupil stage. If they are in a nice sandy field, they can dig down quite deep. And they're probably, unfortunately, pretty protected from our cold temperatures. We might be seeing some mortality, but it's kind of impressive just how cold these insects can survive by digging down in the soil and, and getting down to where they're more at protected temperatures. 
Um, of course, those moths are going to start flying around early July. They lay their eggs in corn and dry beans. Those um, egg masses then hatch out. The young larvae will, um, if there's fresh tassel tissue, the young larvae will crawl up and feed on the tassels. And I'll talk more about that. And then they make their way down to the ear. And then of course, once they're in the ear, this is a very difficult time to control them. So a few of the time points in this life cycle we can think about for management. And these are also then topics that I'll, I'll keep talking about. First, we can think about BT trait selection. Um, you may have already purchased your seeds to get a, get a little better price um, for this year. Uh, scouting is very important. Biological control is something we are looking at. Um, the use of insecticides is, is an important management tool for this insect. And then something I think is easy to overlook is if you um, are using, you know, insecticide sprays or BT traits is to actually go out and look in your fields, say early to mid August, you know, peel off the husks of some ears and actually see, you know, what, how many larvae are you seeing? How many ears, how much feeding damage are they doing? Just to actually get an idea of, of what is or isn't working for you can be important. So starting with this BT trait selection, um, we do, it is important, I think, to realize for Western bean cutworm that not all of the BT caterpillar traits work for Western bean cutworm. So there's a lot of traits out there that work really well for like European corn borer, things like that, but they don't work for Western bean cutworm. There's really only two proteins that have ever worked for Western bean cutworm. The first is Cry1F. This was in Herculex. It's one of the proteins in SmartStacks. Um, However, we have really started to see issues with this starting around, you know, the early 2010s again. Um, so we did a survey and at that point, almost, you know, 88% of Nebraska crop consultants thought that cry went up corn was providing less control than it used to. And that was, the, we were asking them about the 2014 to 2016 growing seasons. We have since confirmed um, resistance to cry one f in Nebraska and Kansas. And here is uh, this genie's help with our egg masses here was huge to be able to also have our Colby, Kansas population. And so, um, you know, we basically saw this cry went up resistance at all of these sites. And these were insects collected in 2017 and 2018. Um, Western bean cutworm has been removed from the label of all cry one up trait products now, I think as of 2019. Um, is the, uh, you know, that they've all been entirely removed. So we kind of, we're not, we, we are not saying that cry one f can, um, you know, give you consistent or reliable protection anymore. It's maybe suppressing it a little bit, but it's not on its own doing enough. We are seeing that just the VIP 3A trait now. This is one that's in products such as um, Leptra, Tricepta, Viptera, um, this is providing very good control as of right now, but we are always concerned about resistance being on the horizon. And I'll refer you again to that handy BT trait table is really great to be able to actually look at like, okay, VIP3A, what are the commercial names and abbreviations of those, those um, trait packages that actually have that protein in it. So the next um, area is scouting. So this can be really important. Um, so when to start scouting, we do have some degree day models that can help you predict when to start scouting. Uh, we do publish um, uh, a crop watch article every year that gives you a table of those predictions. I really recommend this AgriTools app. I, um, it, for, I'm not sure for all of you all in, the, in Kansas, if you are close enough to the Nebraska border, I think that this would give you really good um, information um, about degree day accumulation. And then it tells you um, your prediction. So like as of a few weeks ago out at my house, um, when I checked this, you know, they were kind of showing like, all right, the flight's really gonna start happening. I might need to be ready to come back from 4th of July, ready to start scouting fields. Um, now this doesn't tell you, you know, if you can spray or not, you still have to scout within the field, but this gives you an idea of maybe 
when to start scouting those fields. So we do also post this um, blacklight trap data online. We have this for North Platte, Clay Center, and Concord and Mead, Nebraska. And I'll post the link to this as well. Now, many of you all um, uh, have, uh, or, or may be interested in these green bucket traps with pheromones. And I'm super happy to consult on anybody. If this is something you wanna start doing in your area is putting these green plastic buckets traps out with the moth pheromone to give you an idea of more locally, when are you starting to see the rise and the fall of your moth populations? Now, when you are going out and scouting, um, we recommend selecting uh, 20 plants in five different parts of each field, um, and that would be 100 plants. Now, you can use this Western Bean Cutworm Speed Scout app as well, and for that, you're actually like entering numbers as you see them. And that might give you a decision earlier than the 100 plants. So this can really um, help you to um, save time scouting. I see a question about the growing degree days for K-State Mesonet. That would be really interesting to discuss if there's connections there. You know, we could also, if like, if Jean wanted to send me like, temperature numbers too, I could add some Kansas locations to like our crop watch article um, to, you know, it's easy to plug, once you kind of have the formula, it's easy to just like paste in numbers and add some additional locations. So I feel like we could do some things to help maybe share some of this growing degree day predictions with you guys in Kansas as well. I think that'd be great, Julie. Let's plan on doing that. That way. Yeah, yeah, because we we've, we've also have there. kind of bumped over and some and we'll put like some Wyoming and Colorado locations too for like our panhandle growers. And so I think that would be great to just bump it out, make it a little more of a regional um, article. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So, okay, so for scouting, you know, you do want to examine the surface of the corn leaves um, in the upper third of the plant for egg masses look on the tassel, look in the leaf axles and the ear tips for larvae. And we recommend um, that that treatment threshold is kind of somewhere from the five, minimum five to 8% infested plants. And that could be infested with eggs and or larvae. Um, we can also say that if the corn is at um, milk stage before the eggs are laid, that no treatment is necessary there. So thinking about egg identification, um, the Western bean cutworm are in these egg masses. They're on this top side of the leaf in the upper third of the plant. And it's important to realize that the moth prefers this late world stage corn prior to tasseling. So, um, and I'll talk about why that is a little bit. Now this is different from our corn earworm eggs. They're laid just like one egg at a time and they prefer fresh silks. Um, European corn borer lays their eggs in masses, usually on the underside of leaves, more in the middle of the plant. I think those European corn borer eggs look kind of like fish scales, the way they're sort of laid like flat over top of each other. Um, and then fall armyworm you might also see. This um, moth tends to prefer younger, like vegetative stages um, and sort of those like lower leaves. And that kind of looks like a messy pile of eggs and it has sort of this silky, fuzzy, protective silk on it. Um, one thing that's really easy to confuse with Western bean cutworm eggs are stink bug eggs. So what I do is I look at them from the side and if they're kind of tall and shaped more like a barrel, that's a stink bug egg. If they're more shaped like a basketball that has been slightly flattened, um, that is more of your uh, Western bean cutworm egg. So how often should you scout is an important thing. Um, the important thing to say, show here is that I think some of our older recommendations were saying like five to seven days and that eggs will take five to seven days to hatch. But what we're actually seeing is that, you know, it's very dependent on temperature and probably more like four to six days is gonna be the average that you're seeing, especially when you have hot temperatures out in the field. So when you're averaging about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you're taking 4.6 days for eggs to hatch. So for that reason, um, you know, I'm saying that every four to five days would be more accurate than waiting like once a week. 
And again, it's important to focus on that crop growth stage. The moths are preferring this late whirl to early tasseling plants. Because the larvae that hatch and have access to fresh tassel survive the best. Um, so I wanna share with you guys some biological control that we've looked at. Now, we know that there actually are a lot of good guys at work out there in your field. So these are all pictures that I've taken just from being out scouting cornfields. You know, we have several different nice lady beetle species. We have this um, minute pirate bug. I really like this one. It's like a family meal. This is the adult and this is like the immature pirate bug. Um, and then we have these green lacewing larvae that look like kind of like a spiky alligator to me. Um, we have done some studies where we kind of spied on egg masses in the field. We set up this time-lapse camera and we trained it on a Western, well, we did this on several different Western bean cutworm eggs in the summer in the field. And um, we saw some interesting things. Um, one of them is that these minute pirate bugs would come along and feed on the egg mass. And they spent, you know, maybe 30 minutes eating. And by the time they were done, none of these eggs were able to help hatch and become a healthy um, caterpillar. So they really are doing some good control out there. Um, how can you support the good guys? Um, one way is through planting um, non-crop perennial diverse habitat around your crop fields. We did a project with this um, Corners for Wildlife. Um, this is where there was, you know, like pheasant habitat at the dry land pivot corner. And we actually put these egg cards out in the cornfields next to those corners. And we saw that those um, non-crop habitats supported more lady beetles. And then those lady beetles would go over and eat more Western bean cutworm egg masses. Um, we also want to recommend, you know, of course, using your spray thresholds to avoid unnecessary insecticide spraying and choosing products that are less toxic to beneficials. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I don't want to keep you guys, I want to have more time for questions here at the end. So I might go a little bit fast through a few here, but um, you all should have access to those slides um, through Gene that you can always look back at those as well. So the insecticides, this is a really important um, part of management. Timing can be tough, right? We say you have to, you know, you wanna meet that threshold first um, and you've, you've documented that through scouting. Um, we recommend that plants are at about 95% tassel. Um, egg masses are purple to hatching and you're, you have reached or passed the peak of the moth flight and you have favorable environmental conditions for spring. Now, I know this is like some imaginary perfect alignment of the stars. Does this perfect alignment actually exist where you're going to meet all of these qualifications? Probably not. And that's one of the reasons why insecticides can be challenging, why we sometimes get you know, applications of insecticides against Western bean cutworm that are not as effective as we'd like them to be. Now, I said this peak flight, um, is important. You can see in North, this is North Platte, Nebraska. You can see like last year in 2020, our peak flight was July 21 to 22. Now in 2019, you guys probably remember, um, we were really like very cool in the first half of the summer. And so that peak was quite a bit delayed, but it still matched up with those degree days. Um, product choice is really important for our Western bean cutworms. Um, you know, very similar actually to the story with the corn rootworm, we started to see, have complaints about pyrethroid insecticide performance against Western bean cutworm. Now pyrethroids in our survey were like the group that was like most frequently used. 80% of the insecticides going out were pyrethroids for Western bean cutworm. And now this is a problem because that's a huge selection for resistance. Um, and folks were thinking that maybe the pyrethroids weren't working as well as they used to. So what I think that I will do is not go into like all of more of the research details on this for your time. But what I want to say is that we, um, and we actually did include our Colby, Kansas population in this study as well. But we did kind of similar studies 
um, to the rootworm studies where we collected Western bean cutworm populations from across Nebraska and into Colby, Kansas. And we looked at um, how susceptible or resistant are they to bifenthrin, our most common active ingredient of pyrethroids. What we showed was that um, the Nebraska and Colby, Kansas Western bean cutworm are less susceptible to bifenthrin when compared to a Canadian population. Now they don't use pyrethroids a lot in Canada for regulatory reasons, um, but that resistance was not the whole story. Um, there was not like a smoking gun of resistance like there was for the rootworm beetles. Like we have a little bit of resistance happening, um, but I think we also have big problems with um, application techniques, maybe the timing, the technique, maybe environmental conditions at the time of spraying, and then this pest and crop phenology, like that the stage of the corn and the stage of the insect are, are not allowing you to have this perfect window to spray anymore. And so that's what I'll um, maybe focus on is we wanted to, to look at that pattern. You know, we were hearing also from folks saying like, well, it seems like the window of when the moths are flying and laying eggs is longer than it used to be. So there's no longer this perfect spray time because the window is much wider. And so we looked back at our light trap data long before I got here. This data has been collected for over 30 years from um, North Platte, Concord, and Clay Center, Nebraska. And this is using the North Platte numbers. Um, what we're seeing is basically the 1980s and the 1990s here. We had fewer moths overall. This is like total moths across the whole summer compared to the 2000s and the 2010s. So we are seeing that the kind of the overall moth pressure has been higher in the last 20 years than it was previously. And we're also seeing that the flights are longer and especially the second half of the flights are longer. So back kind of before the year 2000, you the second half of the moth flight might last for about 15 to 22 days. You know, now since about 2000, we're seeing that lasting more like 20 to 27 days. So it's a longer window when they're laying eggs. And it's important to ask like, why does the second half of the flight actually have a greater impact? Um, and that's because those eggs that are laid when the um, corn plant is like later in its development, those larvae will probably survive better versus the eggs that are laid when the corn plant is really early in its development. And that's because if the eggs hatch and there's no tassel and no silk, no reproductive tissues available yet, there's only leaves, they don't survive very well at all. So like less than 4% of larvae survive when they had only leaves to eat. Now they do the very best if they have tassel available to them. Um, and that's why they love that fresh tassel just kind of popping out the larvae, the newly hatched larvae wanna feed on that. Now let's say the eggs are like coming in late and the tassel's already drying up. There's, you know, pollen has shed, you got some silks. That's not terrible, right? It's not as good but they can still survive like 30 to 55% of them. So that's kind of why those, that second half of the flight is more impactful because those insects are gonna survive better. So I do have a few reports of our insecticide trials that we've done. This was in Grant, Nebraska in 2018. This is kind of our biggest study that shows the best representation of what we've tested. We had a 17% egg mass pressure at this site. And it, it ended up when we assessed the ears that we actually had a mixture of Western bean cutworm and corn earworm. Um, we had a large variety of different products. Um, you can see this is our untreated control that was not sprayed. And then these, this is the commercial name and then the fluid ounces per acre rate of those insecticides that were applied. Now you can take 
you know, a little more time to look at these with the link that um, Jean put in the chat. But to show you that the one that suppressed feeding damage, oh, I'm sorry, what you're looking at is the like size of the feeding damage on the ear, like how many kernels did, did the larvae eat? Um, it, and our Prevathon at the highest rate performed the best. Um, this is the percentage of the ears that were infested with larvae. So when we sprayed nothing, 43% of the ears had a caterpillar in them, at least one caterpillar. Um, but the best we did was only 8% of ears had a caterpillar in them. Now we also are really interested in this timing issue, right? So we sprayed a few of these insecticides at what we considered an early and ideal and a late timing. And we saw here that, you know, some products did not have much wiggle room, right? If you came in late, they didn't do very well. Or if you came in early, they didn't do very well. Whereas again, our Prevathon at the higher rate was the one that kind of did the best, gave a little more wiggle room in terms of spraying it early and late was still like pretty good at reducing feeding damage. And a similar thing for the percentage of the ears that were infested. The ideal timing was definitely the best though here. So this is my last study to talk about. I'm really excited about this because this was a question that I got directly from some growers. And they were saying like, um, they, they thought that there was like a rumor going around that some of the insecticides could kill the eggs of the Western bean cutworm. And so I'm like, oh, this is easy. We can test this, um, you know. So we have this great undergraduate student from UNL um, who she did this study. Um, we again did those similar practices where we were um, replicating an aerial application in the field. We tested against um, these five different insecticide products. We also used the low and the high end of the label rate for these products for Western bean cutworm. And unfortunately, we saw no evidence for ovicidal effects. So no evidence that spraying with these insecticides would reduce the number of eggs that hatched. But there was still um, effect on the larvae after they hatched. So there was enough residual for these products that when the larvae hatched a few days after spraying, that the larvae did die um, in all of the treatments except for steward. And I think that's important to mention that it wasn't that steward didn't work, it's just that the way that steward needs to work. So um, that product does need to be ingested as well as the outside of the body of the insect touching it. So in the field, that insect would probably chew a little bit on a tassel and consume the steward that way. But in our lab, we didn't have any food there for them to eat to ingest the steward. Um, we saw actually up to five days of insecticide residual in the lab. Now, of course, in the field, this is probably going to be much shorter with your environmental conditions, irrigation, rain. Um, we also did a study where Rachel, our undergrad student here, um, treated Western bean cutworm egg masses with an insecticide or with no insecticide. And then she put a lady beetle in this Petri dish. And we wanted to know, can the lady beetle um, detect that insecticide is there and avoid the egg? Or if it eats the egg with insecticide, will it kill it? Will it hurt the lady beetle? And we treated with Mustang Max or with Prevathon. So what she found is that the eggs that had been sprayed with Mustang Max, I'm sorry, the lady beetles, they couldn't tell the difference between a, a sprayed and an unsprayed egg. And the lady beetles that ate the sprayed West, uh, Mustang Max, they didn't die, but they did like get disoriented. Like the lady beetles would kind of get like stuck on their back and they couldn't get up. So there's some like neurological effects of the insecticide, but it wasn't enough to actually kill them. Um, whereas if they ate eggs that had been sprayed with Prevathon, there were no negative effects. So that is kind of confirming again, our assumptions that Prevathon or Steward are gonna be less toxic to our good insects that are out there, our beneficials. So our take home points for Western bean cutworm is that this insect has evolved resistance to the Cry1F BT protein. This is the protein that's found in Herculex. It's one of the ones found in Smart Stacks. This leaves VIP3A as our sole highly effective protein for this insect right now. Um, 
There's a lot of beneficial insects that are out there that can help by eating Western bean cutworm eggs and larvae. And I think, you know, we need to, and, and from my side, I need to do more to kind of incorporate that, right? Like I, my, my ideal goal would be something like, okay, your economic threshold is 8%. But if you see one lady beetle for every five plants, you can bump that to maybe like 10% or 12%. So that's sort of what we're trying to work on is incorporating the presence of the good guys to help make decisions about like whether you need to spray or not in your fields. Um, insecticide applications should be made only when that threshold has been met and timing is carefully considered. And then product choice is important to try to minimize resistance. Again, like a very similar, like a broken record with the rootworm is rotating that mode of action is going to be really important. You know, I think we're seeing this in Western Nebraska and Western Kansas, where we've maybe overloved our pyrethroid products a bit because man, they have been really effective and not as expensive. Um, and so they're maybe getting a bit overloved now where we are starting to see resistance issues and trying to rotate away from those can be really critical right now. Um, and that some of these other newer chemistries um, can be less risky to our beneficial insects and that they can be an important component out there as well. So, all right, this is my contact information. I'm super Happy to hear from you guys, you know, over the course of our summer as things are cropping up. I try to share relevant information and timely information like on Twitter. And if you don't follow our UNL Croc Watch, I highly recommend that. It has a lot of relevant um, articles shared there as well. All right. So I'm, yeah, I'm happy to take questions or whatever, whatever you need to do with our timing today. Okay, no, that sounds good. Let's go ahead. If you guys have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box or put them in the comments box or just go ahead and email me, e email them to me at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. And so Craig, I think you're monitoring the Q&A box here on Zoom. Do you have questions for Julie to, to pass along here? Yes, we got a few that have came in. Yeah, do you I can see. Do you want me to just read off of? Yeah. And there, okay. Good with that. Yeah. So, um, so there's a really good question about um, using Bavaria bassiana, which is a entomopathogenic or insect killing fungus. But there's been some success with like potato psyllids or potato beetles, and um, yes, this is actually something that we have looked at for Western corn rootworm and Western bean cutworm management. So I had um, a, a PhD student who looked at, um, she was targeting mostly the rootworms and she would do soil collections from commercial cornfields and she actually isolated some native Bavaria bassiana and Metarhizium anisopliae, which is another good beneficial fungus. And so we are actually looking into that. Um, I'd say we're in very early developmental stages with that, but I think that there is promise for, you know, even something like putting, you know, like using it as a biopesticide, like inoculating the soil. Maybe it could even be like a in furrow application of these um, like fungal spores that could help protect, you know, help kill the rootworm larvae at that stage as they're hatching from their eggs. We did a little bit with the Western bean cutworm. It's not as easy to get to them. Um, when they're down in the soil, they're actually quite protected in that when they're a pre-pupa, if you, you they kind of make like a little case, they almost like turn the, the soil around them into a little bit of concrete. And, and it's really hard to actually get anything to them. So I think that the, the it, it's a little harder to reach the Western bean cutworm in the soil as far as like spraying onto like the young larvae of Western bean cutworm, I actually think there's some viruses that are more promising for like a bio insecticide there. And we are working with a company that has some viruses that target different species of caterpillar. So, I mean, it's like, it's like really in the works. I'm just afraid we're not at the like commercial scale yet. Um, I mentioned those nematodes, we are getting maybe closer to commercial scale for them, for rootworms. Um, so I think there's a lot of promising biologicals there. Uh, the next question is how do pesticides reduce Western bean cutworm populations? Like 
compared with BT hybrids? That's a really good question. It's a bit complicated because, okay, our, our, our VIP protein that's in like Leptra, Tricepta, um, some of those, um, that works really well, but it, you also have to keep in mind that those trait packages, those hybrids are also being sold as the blended refuge or refuge in a bag. So they are actually coming with 5% non-BT seed. So, um, and we actually, we actually have a big issue with that because then you think about how the insect, the larva starts in the tassel. So it could go up to a tassel and if it's on a non-BT refuge plant, and then it gets bigger and it could move to a BT plant and actually survive because it's bigger now. Um, and so it's, that's a problem. <laughs> um, so like you're not, you're definitely not killing all of the, um, you know, caterpillars out there, even with the VIP products, because there is that refuge in a bag. Um, versus an insecticide, I feel like if you get the perfect timing, you could kill 99% or more that are out there. But getting that perfect timing is the huge challenge. Um, that's sort of what we see with the insecticides is they work really well when they're done like perfectly and often perfectly is a lot of conditions that are completely outside of your control. It's not like a thing of, oh, you, you're a really good farmer or you're a really good applicator. It's, it's like, did you have things line up to get like, you know, eggs in one little window and 95% tassel and, you know, you got the plane in there right at that time. Um, we also are doing a lot of studies right now, if you could, to help give recommendations on chemigation for Western bean cutworm, because that is a big question is, at what times does it maybe make more sense to use aerial, or does what times does it make sense to use chemigation, and of course growers want to try to save on the costs of those inputs as well. So I'm not quite ready to share the chemigation stuff, but like this time next year, I think we'll have some really good data there. Um, okay, next one, tank mixes with Lors ban and pyrethroids for both Western bean cutworm and corn rootworm adults. So I have been, I think, hearing and seeing of this quite a bit is folks mixing like a, a fast acting active ingredient and then an active ingredient that has more of a residual. And I do think that th that in, in general is a pretty good um, practice because you can maybe kind of get the best of both, get like the fast acting and then get your residual. That's something that we are actually going to be testing a little bit more this summer. So I guess I can't say like absolutely for sure that's my top recommendation, um, particularly when something that, you know, particularly when we were seeing Prevathon looking really good um, and that Prevathon is going to be less harmful to your beneficials. Whereas if you're putting a Lors ban in the mix, you're gonna be knocking out kind of all your good guys there and they're not gonna be coming back into your field. And you may need to be looking at like what that might do to spider mite populations if you're taking away all your good guys as well. I'm gonna jump in here real quick. Emily, do you have any questions coming from YouTube? Sometimes I feel like we should rotate back and forth just a little bit here. I do not at the moment. We are good to go with the questions in the Q&A right now. Okay, great. I'm going to, I got a few more links I can post in there. Okay, Julie's going to put some links in. Guys, your Q&A code is, or Q&R code, excuse me, Q&A questions, QR code is up on your screen. So anybody who is getting CCA credits, go ahead and scan that QR code or go ahead and email me um, that you are um, done joining this session and so that you've been here the whole time. Um, there's a couple more questions. We're going to go ahead and um, move us just a little forward. I'm gonna change slides for, there is an evaluation because I know we're getting a little tight on time, but I'll let Julie go ahead and continue to answer these questions, but I will um, go ahead. We do have a survey. We would really appreciate everyone filling out on this. And now of course my screen won't move. Um, 
let's see, is this our evaluation thing? I have many, many screens opened up. Okay, I will put the link into the chat box. This is a quick evaluation. It's like four questions long. We do ask a little bit about you guys also, just so for our reporting purposes, we know um, kind of who you are for attending this webinar. But thanks guys for attending. And if you will fill out this evaluation, we'll have Julie to answer Q&A questions here because um, there's a couple more that have came in. Anything else you do have with other questions, um, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. We'll just keep Julie around. I hate to hold everybody else up if you don't have questions to go with this, um, but thanks everybody for joining. And Julie, I'll kick it back to you for more Q&A questions. Yes, okay, I do see one. Um, yeah, so someone was asking about the Cry1F gene offering effective control. So unfortunately, probably that is out. I mean, that is outdated now. Just, you know, the the Cry1F first came out, I think like 2003, 2004. Even when it first came out, it maybe it was like 80% effective. It was never like a high dose, super effective protein for Western bean cutworm. Um, and we now have documented from you know, Western Nebraska and Kansas, all the way out, we had samples came to us from Michigan, um, Ohio, New York, and Ontario, Canada, actually. So that's like a crazy thing about Western bean cutworm is that, um, and I know we actually have some folks on here that it is now a big problem in the Great Lakes region of the US and Canada, um, that it is a, uh, you know, we ha have sandier soils out here and so do they. And that's one reason, you know, that the moth really spread eastward around the year 2000 and they have concerns out there now, whereas it used to just sort of be our, our problem out here in the Western Great Plains. Um, okay, next question is the moths. You mentioned the moths fly for several weeks. So females could lay eggs in a long period. So how do you manage larvae that emerge at different dates? That is a huge concern. I mean, I think that is the problem that we are seeing now with where they, they're they used to sort of be like this one ideal window to spray and you could capture, you could you know treat and kill more of the population with a one-time application. You know, I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm saying like recommending multiple applications. Um, but it is more challenging to capture as much of the population as we can in one spray. And so I think that that is then important for us to be thinking about products that have this residual um, and, you know, thinking about, well, maybe just this one foliar spray is not enough. Like I, I really like the idea, or I, I really think there's a lot of promise and the concept of using an insecticide that is going to have residual, but is not as negative to the beneficial insects. So that, you know, kind of helps take care of that portion of the population. But now since you've used a product that did not kill off all your lady beetles and lace wings and pirate bugs, now those natural enemies can do their job and help clean up some of those later laid egg masses. So I, I see that as being um, an approach that I think will work, is trying to preserve the biological control and using the biological control to complement the insecticide sprays instead of the, having the two sort of fight against each other. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, if you guys have any other questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Julie did put um, several different um, links into our chat box here. We will get them copied and pasted over onto the YouTube feed, um, but lots of information on the Handy T trait table, um, the AgriTools app, scouting app, several other things, um, black light trap data, and so lots of information there. So Julie, did we have another Q&A? I saw yeah. you your head here. Yeah, so the question is about data on efficacy and return on investment of rescue treatments like chemigating to combat corn rootworm larvae in intense pressure. And that is a huge challenge, right? Like I, I don't think that we have, I don't think we have the data to show that that can like reliably, like that's a pretty risky thing for both, from both perspectives, from both insects actually, like, you know, 
trying to, you know, if you're, if you're chemigating to kind of rescue treatment for rootworm larvae, you really have to get that product down in there. You know, you're really going to have to be, you know, you know, using a pretty high carrier volume of water and really trying to get that insecticide down in the soil. And then even if it reaches the insects, sometimes at that stage, the rootworm larvae are actually boring into the roots of the corn. And so those young rootworm larvae that are feeding on the corn roots may actually be completely protected because they're inside of the roots. So I guess I'm not, it's not to say that that never works, but it's gonna be pretty risky. I think it's hard for us to show that there's a reliable return on the investment there and maybe highlights the importance of the crop scouting from the year before to know like what were your rootworm adult pressures there, what sort of egg pressure and larval pressure are you expecting to be there the next spring? Um, I get actually a similar question for Western bean cutworm too, of like, okay, the larvae are already moving into the ear. You're already, you know, they're, they're in the ear, they're protected in the husks, they're under the silks. Can I chemigate and try to like get them up out of the ear? And that's a huge challenge too. By that point, it's going to be really hard to get a return on your investment of doing like a chemigation event to try to get larvae that are already feeding in the ear for, for Western bean cutworm. So yeah, the rescue treatments are just tough and, and I'd say not reliable for both of those insects. Okay, how did we get most of our Q&A Q A's answered here or our questions answered? Looks like it, okay. Okay, looks like our questions have all disappeared out of our Q&A box. So I just wanna thank Julie for spending time with us this afternoon. I know this is a little longer than what we had planned this morning, but thanks for answering all the questions that we had coming in. If you guys have any additional questions, you can always um, email Julie, email myself, and I will get them to Julie and we'll be um, good to go on that. If um, Go ahead and fill out that evaluation for everybody that gives us some feedback and then any additional information um, um, that needs to go back to Julie, we'll send that to her. So she has it too on this on this webinar. Um, I saw a note in here, make sure to remind everybody to join us next week. So next week we have um, Tuesday and Wednesday sessions is on uh, our grain sorghum weed management and then grain sorghum insect management. And we have um, some K-State folks gonna talk about weed management and the insects. So with that, um, Oh yes, yeah, somebody else made a comment. And if you guys enjoyed this, tell all of your friends to come and join us next week. And um, the recording of this webinar will be posted um, here, hopefully by the end of the day or by tomorrow morning. So if there's something that um, you need to send it out to some of your friends or neighbors that they need to know corn insects in resistance, please do so with that. We'll send out a link to that uh, recording when this becomes available. So with that, thanks Julie for hanging out with us today. And a, a big woohoo that we got through all through this with all of us still having electricity today, which is not something I thought we would have to be saying during this webinar series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah, look forward to hearing from anybody else and just, yeah. Stay warm and keep your power on. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we will see you all next Tuesday.